Amy Coney Barrett, nominated to the Supreme Court of the United States, was a professor of law at Notre Dame. She and her husband both grew up in a Christian charismatic community called People of Praise. When she was nominated to the federal bench, she was questioned about the commitment because she was very devout and because the com community was characterized as a cult by some in the media, with handmaidens and heads who supervise various members of the community. Senator Feinstein famously said, the dogma lives loudly in you. And another Democrat senator, Dick Durbin of Illinois, grilled her about being an Orthodox Catholic. This time around, uh, the battles have, start, have started again. Um, is this a form of anti-Catholicism? Is it imposing a religious test on nominees? Perhaps her membership in People of Praise is irrelevant. But the charge of cult and orthodoxy does bring us back to this mysterious group, People of Praise. What is it? How did it shape her life? And how does it continue to shape it? What is charismatic Christianity or Catholic Pentecostalism? These are important questions that are in the news today. It just so happens that one of our faculty members was a participant in People of Praise in the charismatic renewal when he was an undergraduate at the University of Notre Dame in the early 1970s. We look forward to our conversation with him about his experience. Let me introduce Dr. John Hittinger. Um, he's our professor of philosophy and director of Saint, the St. John Paul II Institute. Welcome, Dr. Hittinger. Tell us about your undergraduate experience um, with the people of praise and the charismatic movement. Yes, George, thanks for having me today. Again, it's, it's, it was 50 years ago, actually, this fall that I started as an undergraduate at Notre Dame. And so a lot has changed, but I think at the very beginning of the charismatic renewal at Notre Dame, the people of praise was starting, and I did um, encounter that group and actually spent a lot of time with it, and then with a group that grew out of the people of praise, it was a group called True House. But just to set the context, we go back to the 60s. And I grew up in um, Northern Virginia, and I was very influenced by the counterculture. And I was trying to find my way out of it and back to some sanity, you know, just to um, become a serious student. I did choose Notre Dame. I was an English major. I love poetry. But I had lost the faith, and I was making my way back to the faith. I had read Thomas Merton and was taking it seriously. But when I arrived on campus, there was just a lot of different kinds of Catholic groups on campus. There was Opus Dei, there was a Thomas Merton Center, a nonviolent center, just a lot of different things. I had never heard of the charismatic renewal, but one day, my first semester, I was standing in the quad, and a young man came up to me and said, excuse me, is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? And it just sort of knocked me back, just the boldness of his question. And again, I was, I was searching. And so I sort of stammered, well, I don't know. And he said, you want to go on a Jesus retreat, which was one of the charismatic outreaches. It's sort of based on the Corsio movement, which has been important Hispanic influence on the church, as well as this campus crusade for Christ. So I went on this retreat, and it... It sort of ended with this call to commit your life to Jesus Christ, which you, you know Catholics don't usually do, right. you being a convert. Right. But I, I think it, it had a big impact on my life, and it was a sincere kind of conversion back to the church. And because it was in a Catholic setting, we were encouraged to go to daily mass. It was actually in my dorm. I was in Breen Phillips, which soon became the woman's dorm. But I went to the mass. They, they said, have you been to confession in a while? I said, no, they encouraged that. So it had a very Catholic dimension to it. But nevertheless, there were these strange things that went on. I, I agreed, I sought baptism in the spirit I was speaking in tongues, and I went to these big prayer meetings of people of praise, which would have hundreds of people from the community, students, faculty, and they would sing joyous songs, they would speak in tongues, they would have prophecies. It was all very odd, but as an 18-year-old, as I said, coming out of the counterculture, I've, I had seen some odd things, and 
And it, it was part of this Jesus movement. It appealed right. to me. Right. So that was sort of my basic experience. It was right. positive, but strange. And so, yeah. yeah. How, did, how did the administration at, at Notre Dame relate to this? Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. I would say they kept a distance because it was a new thing. It, it was somewhat controversial. And also the charismatics tended to be very negative about Notre Dame. You know, where is its Catholic? I mean, the typical things people <laughs> still say. But um, there, there was a lot of tension there. They, they attacked uh, some of the professors. I still kept up my life of studies. My brother joined me. Uh, there were some great professors we had. So there was this tension that I wanted to pursue Catholic intellectual tradition and the charismatics who were sort of pushing in another direction. But you, you see now they have an office on campus, but back okay. then it was pretty rocky relationship. Yeah. Is there anything um, to the charge of it, of it being a cult? That's something that's bandied about, and it's yeah. easy when you <clears throat> hear that to simply dismiss it as anti-Catholicism um, and uh, an ignorance. Um, yeah. But is there any, any grain of truth anywhere? Well, no, that? you know, that's what got me thinking to do this interview with you. On the one hand, you hear this cult charge. Then I've heard some Republicans say, look, people of praise is nothing more than a Bible study. Well, no, it's more than a Bible study. I mean, I, it, it is what's called a covenant community. And it's had 50 years, I think, to work out some of the problems. But I would say it was apparent in this little group I joined. I actually got more involved with a group that came out of People of Praise called True House. And these, these problems popped up right away. And I would say True House was more like a cult. People of Praise, I think, was sort of struggling with the issue. But here, here's some of the reasons why that is a challenge, was a challenge to the Catholic Charismatics. I do think People of Praise has worked through it. But they tend to rely on very intense lay leadership. So there, there can be a cult-like figure who's the preacher and who tries to get people to join. I think that's an issue. This alienation of people, say, from Notre Dame or your family or even the church. Right. You know, they pull you away from the parish. But I think most of all, it was this phenomenon that came out of the Pentecostals and into, Catho into the Catholic movement called shepherding. And that's where they would assign a young person to someone older, sometimes only a few years older, who at the time would pretty much make the decisions for somebody. Now the People of Praise, I think, explains well on their website its spiritual direction, its advice, we respect freedom. At the time, this True House group, I wouldn't include People of Praise, but I know some people who think they had that problem at the early stage too, would tell young people what to major in, who to date, when to date, and it, it crept over into an abuse of freedom. Mm. So, you know, my brother and I actually were part of a group that quit this true house. We called the bishops. It, it, it actually made me appreciate the Catholic Church and its authority. Mm. They did come in, they interviewed us, and at the end, they said, this must be shut down, True House, not People of Praise, right. because they forced manifestation of conscience, they violated freedom, they had unauthorized exorcisms, just a, a lot right. of wild right. and woolly stuff. So I think that is a problem with charismatic Christianity. But I do think God brings good out of evil in that experience at Notre Dame did great things for my life and my brother. I do think people of praise over time has um, grown and matured like all of the um, charismatics. And Amy Comey Barrett is an example now of three generations right. through this community. So my sense is the cult charges and the fanatic charges are off base and do border on, well, Certainly anti-Christian, if not anti-Catholic, because 
This is a form of Christian worship that has a history in America, blended with Catholicism. It's an ancient tradition, and it ought to be respected and applauded, I would say. Right, right. Well, and as, you, as you pointed out, there, are, there is a tradition in, in the Catholic Church of these smaller intentional communities yes. that are ordered yes. to a higher purpose. And there were things that were unique in the culture at the time and attempted to build these around the laity, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know there are going to be missteps in that process. That's know, right. Whatever That's the good right. intentions. And I think one of the challenges is how do you apply the wisdom of the church in having an intentional community? How do you apply it to a new situation? You know, to a, yes. a situation of the laity. The idea that you would come together um, in a community um, to grow in your faith, um, ordered to the highest possible purposes, that you would have a hierarch- hierarchy within that community. That's not new. That's not um, new. But to apply it in this new situation, inevitably challenges are going to arise. And it seems like the cult challenge is, or the, the, that, that charge, it neglects what you described as the historical development, the decades That's of true. growth. That's true. Because, no, these were pioneers in this whole movement. And it did pop up in other places. You know, there was a Mother of God community in Maryland where the bishop intervened. Actually, Steubenville had some issues with this, a group there the bishop intervened. But I think the wisdom of the church is we see the charismatic dimension does have to be matched by that institutional right. and hierarchical. You need them both. Right. You need the charisms. You need the new burst of the Holy Spirit on the scene. And it's not always going to be neat and orderly. Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad you brought out that, that ecclesial dimension because, you know, um, uh, there are those who would trace the origin of this back to the earliest church days. But often... Um, those in the movement refer back to um, Paul VI. Yes. Right? Um, and, the, and John the Twenty Third. Um, could you say a bit about the relationship between the movement, yes. and these groups, and the larger ecclesial? Yeah, no, that's a great question, too. When I was at Notre Dame and starting to phase out from those communities, um, they were actually planning these international meetings, and they were going to have their first meeting in Rome. And Paul VI met with them. Some people warned him and said, you got to be careful. But I think Paul VI saw it as a sign of renewal, this work of the Spirit, the the, uh, role of the laity. And of course, John Paul II met with them repeatedly. He encouraged many movements in the church, communion and liberation, the neo-catechumenate way. Again, movements are important for renewal, but again, they have to be done in a way consistent with the church. Actually, John Paul II has been called, among his many names, the Pope of the Holy Spirit. He gave, we all know the theology of the body. He gave a very remarkable set of Wednesday audiences on the Holy Spirit. I, I'll put in a little plug. That's one reason we have our John Paul II Institute, because John Paul II was a man of the Spirit, also deeply committed to the traditions and structures of the church. But I think he did want to encourage that sense of the Spirit in our everyday life through the gifts of the Spirit. And, um, you know, the charismatic renewal has renewed many parishes throughout the country. There's one here in Houston, the Charismatic Center. They actually sponsored a play about John Paul II, and I brought students over there. Um, every diocese has some outreach to the charismatics. So I think, um, yeah, it's been a 50-year story. I was there at the beginning. I would say my faith and a kind of, I don't know if I'd call it a charismatic style, but I do like that kind of openness, fraternity, um, right. ready to meet every day with a, with a sense of the newness of God. It's a great thing. Right. So, so in your, your estimation then, you know, Amy Coney Barrett's experience of the people of praise, we should probably look at this as a, as a positive thing. Clearly, she assesses it as that mm-hmm. um, and one that's developed over time and, and with her family. Um, and to criticize her and criticize her involvement in this way, um, we really run the risk of m- moving toward a kind of bigotry, a kind of yes. anti-Catholicism and an infringement on religious freedom as we hold up a religious test. Um, that the, the reality, if you will, of the situation is different from way it, the way it's being characterized. 
Yes, yes. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have been speaking about this, but it must be affirmed again that there's no religious test for the Supreme Court, a Pentecostal Catholic or not, if they have their judicial chops ought to be considered. And there is, there does seem to be this lingering anti-Catholicism. But George, I would add on even more that I think it strikes at another root mm. of what is great about America to go this direction. And that is, I think of another one of my great heroes, which is Alexis de Tocqueville. I know one you, of my heroes one of your heroes. <laughs> And you know how much he emphasized those intermediate associations, right. that America is great because of intermediate associations, that we need churches and social groups to, you know, help the family. The family is one of them, but also to educate, to do works of charity. And if you go to that website of People of Praise, or at least the statement, I think, was on the Notre Dame website as well, they do much charitable work in South Bend. Um, actually, someone I knew not very well, but Carrie Kohler, who just passed away, may he rest in peace, was a philosophy student of Ralph McInerney, like I was, started a Christian academy in mm -hmm. South Bend almost 50 years ago. Um, I just think this idea that these intentional communities should not be seen as a threat, but as what is rich about America is that we have people like Amy Comey Barrett, who's a law professor, a great intellect, a mother, but also part of this community that has made its mark on South Bend and a movement really that's made its mark on, um, on the whole world and the church abroad. So yeah, I see it as a badge of honor and not a reason for rejection. Right. And you know, I I think people like John Stewart who called her, I can't even say the expletive nutcase, is just so mean spirited and so contrary to what this country is about that well it's the reason actually I felt the Lord inspire me to say go propose that we do this little session because right. I, I usually don't talk about it a lot because sure. it was a long time ago. I could be a little embarrassed that I did <laughs> these crazy <laughs> charismatic things, but you know, it did change my life and I think they ought to be defended now right. in light of these attacks. Well, and I, I think, um, I confess when I got that email from you, I was surprised. I haven't been at the university very long, and I think of you as a Thomist and a scholar of John Paul II, and I yes. have not made the connection yet um, with this with this uh, background. And um, but you know, I, you know, when you read some of Thomas's um, writings, especially the at the end of written at the end of his life, some of the statements he made, they're they're mystical. They are, and they so are. there there's a level of reality that you know I think. Um, you know, even as Catholics who, who seek to embrace the fullness of the tradition, we can lose sight of that, that, that piece of it. Well, you know, actually, let me just say a little bit about that. It's interesting you mentioned Aquinas, because I'd say one of the things that did sort of pull me out of the charismatics at the time was I started reading Thomas Aquinas. And I did feel that experience I had mm. energized my faith, but I thought it did tend towards anti-intellectualism and yet I saw here in Aquinas, I was then reading Jacques Maritain, right. Paul VI, um, that faith and reason component, which I know you're a champion of in your Absolutely. career and you're here at UST to help promote that. This university is, is um, based upon that tradition that there are two wings, faith and reason. And so I wanted to seek that mm -hmm reason perspective, but I have to admit later reading John Paul II, well, even Merton has this, the John of the Cross connection, right. the mystical tradition. It's certainly not as loud or could be noisy as the charismatics. I, I do think at the root of the charismatic experience is prayer. Right. I mean, you know, just another random memory about exactly 50 years ago, someone handed me at this charismatic mass, a, um, a copy of the story of a soul. Wow. And I remember just reading that, and it was just the book I needed.
And yeah. so I still have that book. I still have that copy. It's falling apart. But to hmm. well. so so the Catholic presence came through the Catholic charismatics. And uh, I think, again, I would just say this beauty of our tradition and why we're here at the University of St. Thomas is that we want to have it all. Isn't that right. the great thing about being a Catholic? That's very, that's very Catholic. <laughs> yeah. It's a both and, right? So yeah. and I think that's as someone who who's familiar with the, the charismatic Pentecostal movement outside of Catholicism, um, one of the interesting things was was to see how how these experiences are are developed within the church, right? As you just pointed out, the resources there, one can have a very rich, um, more subjective prayer life, and yet this unfold within a, a sacramental system, with all the riches of Thomas Aquinas and all the doctors of the church. Yes, and and there can be a, it's a very thick, uh, both objective, subjective, faith and reason. It's it's a very thick experience. And, yes. Um, which I don't know that folks who are outside of the Catholic tradition who have charismatic experiences, they, they, ha they can draw on that. And there can be an experience where you, the subjectivity eventually just kind of wears itself out. That's um, right. And Catholics, but they, the Catholics have the storehouses. They have the treasures they can draw on intellectually um, and spiritually. Um, That's true. And, you know, another amazing thing to think about the church and the charismatics is I think after, well, the teaching of Vatican II, not changing essentials, but this new attitude, just, you know, reaching out to pray with others. Right. This people of praise is an ecumenical community. And uh, this friendship that Catholics were making with Pentecostals, then, you know, another one of my um, people I was influenced by was Father Newhouse of First Things. I went to many of his meetings in which he had Jewish scholars, Lutherans. That book, Catholics and Evangelicals Together, I think is a milestone of, of Christianity in America to see yeah. that um, we do have a lot in common. That doesn't mean we want to flatten the differences or say they don't make a difference, but I think Catholics... Are, are open to right. these other Protestant groups because I think this richness we have, we have much to share. We have, right. like, again, who would have thought charismatics would find such a home in the Catholic Church? But I, I think if you look back, it's not surprising. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. So, um, one of the things that I, I think there are there are things within the charismatic movement in the Pentecostal world that can prepare people to become Catholic in ways that folks from other Christian traditions may not have. And one of those um, is if, if you're a charismatic or you're a Pentecostal, when you go to church, you expect on a Sunday morning or a Sunday evening, you expect something miraculous to happen. Yes. You expect some sort of thing that transcends space and time to take place. Yes. It could be it could be anything. It could any, be any a th healing or just... It uh, could be any of those things that St. Paul yeah, speaks of. an inspiration. So I think for Pentecostals who are coming toward the church, when they encounter um, the idea that miracles still take place, you know, um, the idea that of, of the, the bread and the wine becoming the body and the blood, this is not far-fetched. No. Because they are, in a way, being Pentecostal, they're ready for a miracle to happen at their, at their, on Sunday morning. And, and so it's not, it's just, oh, this is just one more way that God is acting among his people. That's right. I, I, I remember hearing a priest say that back when I was involved, that the Charismatics and Catholics both have a sense of God's presence mm. in church, but not just right. in church, in everyday life, that God is present He's present through his spirit and that gift of the spirit that Jesus promised, the spirit of truth, the sp a new advocate that I, I think that was waiting to be brought more into the lives of everyday Catholics. And, and right. so you, by the way, I don't know if you know the history, but the first Catholic charismatics were professors at Notre Dame. No, I didn't know that who were at Duquesne, it was called the Duquesne Experience, and some Pentecostal preachers prayed over them huh. for the baptism in the Spirit. I think that was about 68 or 69. Mm -hmm. I got to Notre Dame in 70, but it did, it did spread like a wildfire across the church. And so um, it, it's a two-way street, I think, that you see in the Catholic Charismatics, not just Catholics will tolerate it, but they actually did see 
that there were gifts that others have to bring to the table. Right. And again, I think John Paul II is a great example of that as well, that he's the first one to go to a Lutheran church, to you know, a Jewish synagogue, right. that um, God's presence in the world is a precious thing and uh, it's not only in the Catholic Church, but the Spirit moves as he will. And uh, yeah, that, that's a great attitude, I think, yeah. and a great way to look at our yeah. life. Yeah, God's work is mysterious. It is. And uh, you mentioned Father Newhouse earlier, and he, he basically, you know, as a convert, I was very influenced by his own story. I'm yes. coming in, and you know, he said that everything that he had experienced, you know, God purified and brought with him into the church as a Catholic. And that, that's sort of how, how I, I think a yes. lot of converts think of this, is yes. the Holy Spirit was working in our lives from the very beginning, drawing us toward the church. And there were so yes. many goods there that he allowed. Um, so yeah, there's much to be grateful for. So you went from Pentecostalism to Episcopalian. <laughs> well, there were a few stops. Or a few there more were, stops, there were a few stops finally the to the church. Um, yeah, there were a few stops. Yeah. So, um, but uh, it's, um, yeah, but you know, the, I, I don't think that anything good was left behind. Um, yes. I think God, God has purified that um, that those experiences, and um, I'm extremely grateful. You know, so. I think that's also another part of the American story is just that we do have religious freedom. We are encouraged to search. There's a lot of changing back and forth. Right. You know, my mother was a Lutheran. Hmm. Um, my grandmother was Quaker. Interesting. They became Catholic, but then some of my cousins who were Catholics have become Lutherans, you know, I mean, <laughs> this yeah. freedom of conscience, we must pursue the truth as we see it. Right. And um, I think that's, again, another thing at stake here in this debate over Amy Comey Barrett is that uh, th this is part of the American experience, right. religious enthusiasm, religious quest, religious conversions, religious service. It's, um, it can't be airbrushed out of our story. And right. I do think there are people who are afraid that that's happening in the public sphere. That was Father Newhouse's thing. Right. But certainly our, our education has done that. And, um, you know, again, I don't want to harp on it, but the fact that a major talk ho host would say she's a nut, and even right. worse than a nut, I'm sorry, this is what America is all about. Look at your ancestors, look at immigrants, look right. at how th it's religion is part of human experience. Religion is an important part of our lives. And again, we are lucky here at the University of St. Thomas because God is at the center of it. Right. Not only faith, but these other things we will do. Absolutely. Literature, science, Absolutely. nursing. Yeah. They can all be related to the divine center. Absolutely. Well, this was not a conversation I expected to have. And I'm so glad that you contacted well, me. You. And you've shed a lot of light on this. And I think your personal experience um, is very helpful and illuminating. Um, and so thank you. Do you want to say a few words about the center? Well, thank you. Yes. The John Paul II Institute, we're calling okay. it, is um, just founded last year. Our president, who has a great devotion to Maximilian Kolbe, and I've been working on John Paul II and traveling to Poland. He invited me to start this institute, and we have a new online MA program. We take undergraduates to Poland on this study abroad to follow the footsteps of John Paul II, and now graduate students will be going. So again, I think it's another great story about, you know, John Paul II came to this country, touched a lot of people, and uh, we want to keep that tradition alive. And I feel blessed that the president has asked me to do this, to go from being in the Center for Thomistic Studies and my study of Thomas, which I'm keeping up. But I'm now fully devoted to John Paul II, his life, his, his work, his, um, yeah, just tremendous gifts he brought to the church. So thank you for oh, sure for being a supporter, and I look forward to working with you here, yeah. George, at St. Thomas. The, the feeling is mutual. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you. And I hope we can do this again soon. Yeah, yes, okay. let's do. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure.